I'm very grateful for your courage and your willingness. Sylvia, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation aren't the same thing. So can you tell us more about how you understand your sexual identity as a non-binary person? So I'm Sylvia, I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as non-binary. Um, and I also identify as pansexual and demisexual and quaromantic. Uh, demisexual is a, an asexual spectrum identity, meaning that I experience sexual attraction primarily or exclusively in the context of an existing emotional bond. Um, and qua romantic means I don't even know what romance is. It's the French word qua. Some people call it WTF romantic. Um, I don't really def differentiate between friendships and romantic relationships. I have very similar uh, feelings for my close friends as I do for my spouse. Um, my spouse is a cisgender man um, who is straight and allosexual, as in not asexual and very much not queer, um, <laughs> but he's a good ally. Um, so for me, my non-binary identity hasn't really affected my sexual orientation or anything because I was already not fitting a binary set of language for my orientation um, by pan, queer, demi, Qua romantic, all of those are things that kind of exist outside of any concept of gender being any particular thing. Um, I would identify strongly with the word queer because it just kind of encompasses all of the many parts of my identity, both gender-wise and sexuality, romantic attraction-wise. So then, can you tell us about discovering the language of non-binary? And in what ways has having language to describe something about yourself been helpful? So language has been really helpful for me in all of those identities, in identifying myself as a person who is queer at all. Um, before I learned the word bisexual, I thought I was straight. Um, before I learned that there was an option other than male and female, I thought I was a woman because, well, I'm not a man. I am very much not a man. Um, so as I learned the terms, as I got to know people in the non-binary community, at first I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm an ally. I, like, it's really important to me that there be gender neutral bathrooms because this affects my friends and this is really important to me as an ally to my friends. And then over time, I started like realizing that that was not the whole picture, but without that concept of non-binary, without the language of non-binary, I think I would still think I was a woman and I'm a lot happier knowing who I am better, um, being able to express myself in ways that feel more like me. I used to more or less use my spouse as a paper doll because I really liked menswear. <laughs> and at some point I realized that I could just wear it myself. I still use him as a paper doll sometimes. I'm like, okay, so you're wearing this so that you coordinate with me because you know we're going somewhere together and I want to be cute. But you know, now I have my own, like my own bow ties. He doesn't wear bow ties, and that was like one of the life's greatest tragedies before I realized I could wear them myself. Thanks. Let's talk about pronouns, baby. Uh, we're going to start with Beck, if that's okay. Can you describe for us how you feel when someone uses your pronouns? Yeah. And how does it feel when someone forgets? And what's the best way to respond? I came up with this question before um, Beth Vaughn told people to do a skit yesterday. <laughs> um, but what's the best way to respond when someone messes up your pronouns? Yeah, so my name is Beck, and I use they, them pronouns. 
And I guess when someone uses my pronouns, I feel normal. Like a lot of the time I don't even notice. Um, but then when I do notice, it's like this little emotional hug of just like feeling affirmed and real. And um, yeah, it just feels really good and normal. Um, and when someone messes up, it tends to feel sort of like a small punch to the heart, um, which is fine when it happens once, it sucks. But I heard this analogy of like, you get like pinched every time someone messes up your pronouns. And the first time it's like annoying and a little painful. But if it happens every day, all the time, it's really, really unbearable. And that's sort of what it feels like. Um, I'd say the best way to respond if you mess up, as you saw last night, is a short apology or just correct yourself. And the very best response is to practice so you don't mess up again in the future. So I've done this myself. If I want to practice either pronouns I'm not familiar with, like A, A, R, M or something, or just for someone whose pronouns are different than the way they were when I first met them, I might just be like walking down the street or in the shower and just be like, oh, Lids is super cool. They are my friend and they're on this panel with me. And just, if you can say it aloud, it's even better because you'll get the muscle memory working and that's a really great response. My name is Lids. Some of you know me from last night. I use they, them pronouns. When somebody uses my pronouns properly, I either have the reaction of, yes, that feels right. And in this community, that's the reaction I always feel. When it's somebody who I can tell is really struggling with it, it gives me a little feeling of guilt because I'm a people pleaser and I don't like it when I'm making others uncomfortable. So like sometimes with my parents, if they mess up and then I can tell that they're struggling to get it right, and I know that they're really trying and they're amazing allies, I'll feel that little bit of guilt knowing that I'm making things harder for them than if they could just use the pronouns that they're used to using for me. But I remember I was, the first time my friend Billy here um, used they them pronouns for me, I was, was so happy, it was the first time I'd ever heard anyone use them for me because he wasn't struggling, he just did it naturally and it felt so right. Um, and it made me feel seen and like people really loved me and accepted me for who I am. Can you read the rest of the question for me, Wendy? Yeah, what should people do if they mess up? So for me, I like it when just people are like, sorry, they, and then continue. Not make a big deal about it, not over apologize. If you were here last night, you saw the skit Denise and I did when Denise made a giant deal about it the first time. Um, and that's, because that's pointing it out, that's making us feel other, making us feel different all over again. So just, yeah, a nice, sorry about that, they, and continue on with what you were saying. Finish the story, finish the sentence. Um, and part of the question was about what it feels like when you get misgendered too. Where I live right now in a small town, I get misgendered every single day. And I've heard other people talk about when I, feel, when I get misgendered, it's kind of a downer, but it doesn't really affect me a ton. But when I get properly gendered, I feel amazing. So it's more so when somebody does use the right pronouns for me or does see me for me, that feeling of overwhelming joy. Um, and I'm kind of used to being misgendered. And I don't like that I'm used to it, and it really bugs me that I'm used to it, but I, I have to be used to it where I live right now. Lids, for some people, they hear you identifying as non-binary and then being misgendered. Mm -hmm. And they might be thinking, well, non-binary sort of means you're not in the binary of gender. So what does misgendering look like? So can you just give us a practical yeah. example of someone misgendering mm -hmm. you? So for instance, in my workplace right now, I am not out. And there are only two guys who work um, at the thrift store I work at. So they don't work in the same area as me, so we are referred to as the ladies. We're the ladies in the back sorting, we're the ladies who are on cash, um, we're the ladies who are in the room hanging up the clothes. 
And so that's because I am not a lady. That is misgendering me. When people use she, her pronouns for me, those aren't the pronouns that I identify with. And so that feels wrong and misgendering me. Um, even usually with kids, sometimes will think I'm a guy. That doesn't feel right, and that is still misgendering me, but it feels better than people thinking I'm a girl, because at least they're not thinking I'm a girl, and that's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> even if they're still getting it wrong. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah. Beck, what has the coming out process been like for you? What have been some of the best moments and maybe what are some of the difficult moments in the coming out process as non-binary? Yeah, so in general what it's like is that I keep coming out. First I came out as bi, then I came out as queer, and then finally I came out as non-binary. Kind of maybe I'm considering it, and then I actually came out as non-binary. Um, so it also just takes a long time in that sense, but also because everyone everywhere assumes that I'm a woman, except for the one random cyclist who was like, thanks, sir, when I stepped out of his way. And I was like, yes. <laughs> but also like slightly like oh okay <laughs> but in general um so either I have to deal with being misgendered or I have to come out to people all the time um and so that's in general what it's like the hard parts definitely the worst part is the anticipation um building it up in my head how will people respond I recently sent a letter to half of my family, the easy half. Um, and I was expecting, like, my anticipation, I didn't know what to expect, but my anticipation in my head was just some of the highest anxiety I've ever felt. Um, some of. <laughs> but the responses I got back, like, they weren't perfect. Some little parts stung, but in general, it was also just a lot of relief because A, I wasn't hiding anymore, and B, People can really surprise you and even not perfect responses feel better than anticipating and hiding and being misgendered all the time. Mm -hmm. um, another big part is shame, the doubting yourself, like Liz was saying, when people who aren't super comfortable with your pronouns are using them, there can be a lot of guilt and shame and feeling like I'm uh, an imposter, like it's not real, it doesn't exist. Um, so when I come out to people who don't get it, I can often feel like a fraud. Um, but being around people who normalize it is the best feeling. So the best feelings, um, like, I guess my parents' initial response was really difficult. So that was like one of the less good feelings. Um, and they had some really challenging questions my mom had, and my dad mostly just didn't talk about it. But over several months they've been coming around and like using my name and pronouns and that's some of the best feeling because like my immediate family is using my name and pronouns and um yeah and coming out to extended family like it doesn't feel necessarily good but it feels like a relief which is like part of the best part of coming out and also just discovering amazing people like these people right here and many of you in the audience. Thank you. We're going to start with Robin on this one, who's been quite quiet. <laughs> what have been some of the most liberating, joyful experiences you've had since embodying a non-binary gender identity? And what have been some of the difficult and challenging experiences? So not just focused on coming mm. out, but embracing it for yourself. So I think the most amazing thing is probably the, the first thing I felt. And it was, and it was actually at a, um, it was a conference at a very conservative church. I had no, I had no language or to describe myself. I was just me forever, right? We're all me. And the phrase, you are allowed to be the way God made you, was transformative. And it happened in the context of 
in terms of what I felt emotionally, what I felt uh, physically even, just how I thought and everything else, that I had um, maybe not overtly, consciously, not suppressed, I know that's the right word, just without having language, you can't categorize it and you can't describe it. And so you have a feeling. And then once you get a, a word, so you, it, put, it puts sort of a box around it and usually they don't quite fit, right? They fit sort of, but not quite. And it was, it was that I had been made the way I am, which I now describe as non-binary, and it's the way I'm supposed to be. And it was an affirmation to me that, uh, well, I, I, I know God said, God said it to me. It's, it's basically, well, you know, you finally caught up to what I knew about you all the time. And so I've never felt shame about that. But that's probably because it was not connected to myself of identity when I was very young. If I'd come out, uh, if I'd learned that a long time ago, it could have challenged me to the core because I hadn't, wouldn't have figured out how to deal with it. But later, it's like, okay, so here's all how the, the pictures fit, and I'm that, and I'm really cool with that, and, and if you're not, we can have a really great discussion. <laughs> so, what was the second part of your question? What have been some of the challenges? Oh, so the challenges, of course, again, is language. And so, while it's helpful in one sense because it's a box, uh, I was thinking last night, I thought, if I could have a picture there, I'd put a picture of a person on the board, and then you'd superimpose various kinds of boxes on them. And there'd always be an arm or a leg or a head or something sticking out, because they don't quite fit. There's no, not one that covers you entirely. And so it's a blessing in the sense that I can find a way to, to describe myself that others can relate to and say, yes, we have something in common. On the other hand, it's a box which comes with a whole pile of assumptions and presuppositions that people place you in a box and said, oh, if you are that, then you must be like this. And all the stereotypes and all the prejudices and all the things they've heard in the media and everything else you can think of comes into play. And so I try to avoid using terms like that when I'm talking to people, um, say, in the church. I would describe myself, and they have absolutely no problem with it. But if I use the word to describe it, all of a sudden you could, you could see um, like barriers going up in lightning speed around, and it's like mm -mm -mm, little wall around. And, and I, I naively, when I first uh, um, understood this, I, I said to some people, "Okay, so this is what's going on." I saw the barriers go up, and I realized, "Uh oh, that wasn't safe." So now I don't do that, and I just describe it. Can you just, in, in brief summary, how would you describe it to a church person without using the language non-binary? Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so I can... Open I, yourself up to yes, this. Yes, yes. Um, so this one actually happened. Um, what, the, the first word I had was just transgender. I didn't have binary. And then the, it was kind of right, but it didn't quite fit. I had an arm and leg sticking out, so it didn't work, so I had to find a better one. I was at a barbecue uh, with uh, a small group at our church one summer, and as happens with me almost all the time, the, you know, this, the, the men usually gravitate off to go talk about something, the women go talk about something else, and I usually go with the women, because that's just the way it is, and, and it's bugged my wife for years, but, you know, it's, she, she got used to it, <laughs> and she says, yeah, yeah, I know, that's you. Um, and. At that point, I, I come into this awareness about myself, and I started describing how I felt emotionally. And I said, you know, it's, um, I said, well, I think God's been showing me that um, the way he has made me is um, I am as you see me, but I, I feel and think very much in a female way on a lot of things. Um, not entirely, but I described a bunch of things and didn't face them at all. In fact, one of them said, well, of course we know that. that that's why we like you. You're, we understand who you are. You're you, and you're, very, and, and you're real about it. And so that was affirming to me. Um, but if I said, I am non-binary, you can imagine people would be saying, OK, that means, because they're starting to interpret the terms on their own basis, not on what you're saying. So uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's a non-coming out. or Like, if you use a word, that's kind of a coming out, but also describing who you are as a coming out. And maybe it's safer. I don't know. And once I get used to it, maybe I can say, oh, by the way, that's non-binary. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah? Yes. 
Same question, Beck. What have been some of those liberating experiences for yourself personally? Yeah. Um, so some of the most liberating and joyful experiences. Last summer, I had a weekend um, where I was at a smaller conference, and there were, I don't know, <coughs> fewer than 100 people there. But there were like five or six non-binary people, too, um, which was amazing. And um, we basically, like, we're just so overjoyed to find each other um, that we spent most of the weekend just hanging up and hanging out in our own little clump. Um, I think Lids was there. <laughs> and it was just the first time that I'd really been surrounded by so many people who just got it. Um, and I didn't have to explain. There was no like, oh, so like, what is your gender? Or explain that to me. Or how do you use those pronouns? It was just like, a group of people who would stand by each other, correct someone if someone else messed up our pronouns. It was incredible. Um, and so just having NB and trans friends, um, also gender euphoria days, days where instead of feeling dysphoria, I feel really yeah. confident in my gender. Those are the best days. Having people Beck, consistently. Can you just tell us what gender dysphoria is? Yes. Just for and some euphoria. Things. Yes. <laughs> so gender dysphoria for me generally well, and for trans people generally, there can be social dysphoria, which is discomfort within society because of how people are interpreting your gender. Um, and then there can also be physical dysphoria, which is more to do with like how, your how you feel in relation to your body. So for me, I experience both kinds of dysphoria. Some trans people may experience one, the other, or neither, or both um, uh, types of dysphoria. And euphoria is sort of the opposite, just feeling confident and secure and normal within my physical and or social presentation and experience. Um, and another great experience I had was my childhood youth pastor. Um, I recently came out to him and I got to go with him and his wife and they just listened to my story. They want to hear it. It was something they were not very familiar with were slightly uncomfortable, but the response, they just listened and at the end said, yeah, we needed to hear that, thank you, you gave us a huge gift. And that was very freeing because I felt a lot of shame around people I had known in childhood finding out. And I guess the difficult and challenging experiences is, in my life, I'm generally not misgendered in my day-to-day -day life just because I've gotten to a really amazing point where most people gender me correctly, the people I see every day. So a really difficult thing was going to stay with family for a time and being misgendered, and I hadn't been repeatedly misgendered for so long in months. And I didn't expect it to be so hard, but halfway through the week I broke down, I called my friend, and I was just crying and swearing on the phone because that, like, I just had to get it out. And it was just, so that is definitely the hardest thing, is just the shame and all of a sudden being back, being misgendered, where it's all of a sudden so much worse because you know what the other side feels like. Some of the best liberating and joyful experiences for me are around strangers who don't know my gender. And like there was this little girl who came up to Cash one day and she just walked right up to me. She was probably like six or so. She walked right up and said, so, are you a boy or a girl? And I was like, oh, that's awesome. You don't know. <laughs> um, her mother pulled her away before I could talk to her more. But, and it just made me really happy because it was everyone else there was seeing me as a girl. And she saw that there was something different there that I wasn't. Um, I was in Kensington Market one day. And there was just one of the, co one of the workers in one of the stores. There was a confusion with the line. And... Somebody tried to butt me, and the worker said, sorry, they were here first. And didn't know me. I wasn't wearing a pronoun bin, pin, nothing. They just saw me and used they them pronouns for me, and it made me really, really happy because <laughs> I was seen by somebody who didn't even know me. Another one of the most, um, the times when I felt the most euphoria around my gender is I have really bad chest dysphoria. And not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before at the Christmas party, Denise had ordered me my first binder, and she bought it to the Christmas party. 
and I went to the bathroom and I put it on and then I got stuck in it and then I asked Max what to do and he helped me and then I got it on property. <laughs> and when I came back out and I looked in the mirror, it just felt so right having that flat chest and a lot of the time at home and at work I don't bind because it's really hard on your ribs to bind every single day. But the days that I can bind and do bind, um, it feels right and I feel like I look right and I look, I look how I feel then those days. Um, the most difficult things would have to be times when, even though my pronouns get messed up on an everyday basis, my name is something that pretty much everyone in my life, including people I'm not out to, they know me by lids and they call me lids. So the times when I'm with Sometimes it will be family, sometimes it will be people who I've known for a longer time or haven't seen in a long time. Or I have one particular coworker who calls me by my birth name nonstop as well. And just hearing that over and over and over again, that I find really hard. And those are days that often are going to the bathroom and to cry a little bit and hide a little bit days. Um, that's a big source of dysphoria for me. Sylvia, it seems like non-binary folks embody this reality in different ways. Just, you know, and I, and it's not because anyone's trying to confuse anyone else, but what are some of the things you're learning about that diversity as you've interacted with other non-binary people? Yeah, um, we do embody it in lots of different ways. The thing about it being kind of an umbrella identity is there are many, many non-binary identities. Uh, there are people like me who use she, her pronouns. There are people who use he, him. There are people who use they, them. There are people who use neo pronouns like Z. There are people who prefer not to use pronouns at all. So there's a lot of diversity even just on pronouns and then you get into how people identify their gender, whether that's non-binary, genderqueer, demi-girl, demi-boy, agender, there are lists of hundreds of genders online, you can look them up. So there's a lot of different- A few heads just exploded out. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, but, Another thing to note is, while all of us on this panel are a little bit on the pasty side, the non-binary is not something that white people have a mo monopoly on. I have non-binary friends who are not white. I have non-binary friends who are mixed race. I have non-binary friends from all walks of life. Um, they're not, we're not all skinny, white, assigned female at birth, people with teal hair. Although I am a skinny white assigned female at birth person with teal hair. I, I look like the stereotype actually of what non-binary often looks like, but that's not at all universal. We look like everyone here. Um, and you can't necessarily tell by looking at somebody that they're non-binary. Um, so, you know, always better to ask. Um, let's see, what are some other things I've learned? Um, we've touched on dysphoria and euphoria. Those are common experiences um, among non-binary and also binary trans people. <coughs> and as Beck mentioned, not all non-binary people experience dysphoria. I experience much more gender euphoria than gender dysphoria, which is nice, I will say. Um, not that I don't have some dysphoria, but that, that can also, though, make it a lot harder to figure out that you're non-binary because you're like, oh, I don't experience dysphoria, I can't be trans. Um, and then you realize, wait, somebody got confused by my gender in a washroom and it made my week. I'm probably not cis. <laughs> Beth, can I do a quick time check? Five minutes. I want to get this question in. So Robin, how has your faith intersected <coughs> with your journey to understand your gender identity? 
I would say I can't separate the two almost. Um, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. I am the beloved of God. I'm made in the image of God, and he doesn't make mistakes. Amen. And so once, I, once you get rid of the idea that you are somehow defective, or there's something you need to fix, or it's at your core and you never can, so you're just worthless, Those, that's toxic beyond belief for anybody. Um, I'm fortunate in that I had, to, I had to deal with that before I was ever aware of uh, the term non-binary. And it was around some stuff, in, uh, you know, largely from the conservative church, just about, um, if you, especially around sexual sin and stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, stuff in the church. So, you know, people are dealing, uh, especially guys, let's say they're dealing with pornography and masturbation. So the church will teach you, this is bad, you've got to repent of that. And so people go on this track or whatever else. And there's many other things, not just that. And shame comes in there because you can't do anything about it because it's who you are. You've been made that way. It's deep. You have no idea how to do with it. But when you get rid of that toxic thing and you realize God says, who, t who is telling you this junk? That's what it kind of felt like God was saying. Then don't listen to that. And so once you can extract yourself out of that, then that's what I call a solid faith foundation in the goodness of God and the goodness of his creation that I can now step into that. And when he says you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you're allowed to be the way you are, that means I, can, I really can feel euphoric about that I can rejoice in it, and I can say, yeah, this is great. This is me, and I'm going to take it out for a ride, and I don't really care what other people think. Uh, and then on the other hand, you say, well, I really do care what other people think because so I've got to, you know, you've got to guard yourself. But so for me, the, um, I don't know that if it had not been for my faith and understanding that, of, that God had made me the way he had, how I would have accepted it. I don't know how I would have de dealt with it. And so, really, I can't separate those two things, and I find absolutely no inconsistency between um, my gender identity or, you know, really anybody's or sexual orientation or anything like that. It's the way we're made, and we've always been the same person we've always been. Nobody said, oh, I'm going to decide to be somebody else. I mean, anybody here done that? I, I, I haven't met anybody who says, yeah, I just decided I'm going to be different today, and I've changed the core, my core being. Um, it doesn't happen. And so therefore, if that's the way I've been made, my faith will tell me that it is good. Amen. We, we're going to skip one question, but I want to just ask a very practical one, and any one of you can answer it. For folks out there who might say, wow, this is the first time I'm really hearing about non-binary, and I have a lot to think about now, how would you suggest they do their homework? How would you suggest they get some resources and learn more? Um, there is a YouTuber named Ash Hardell who has a lot of amazing educational videos about this. If you are just curious about some of the identities that Sylvia started to list off, um, they have two videos. They had a, well, they have a video series called the ABCs of LGBTQ+, based on a book that they wrote. Um, and they have two videos in that series about gender. And they have a whole bunch of other great guests on their channel to talk about different gender identities. And I would definitely suggest checking them out and checking out their um, videos about gender. Ash Hardell. Hardell. Yeah. H-A-R-D-E-L-L, -L, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and also the website Everyday Feminism has a lot of really good ar articles about um, the non-binary community and how to be a good ally to that community. And they, if you just search um, non-binary in the search bar of that website, they have a lot of really good stuff too. Anyone else have ideas? Pardon? Neither of I think there might be some on everyday feminism. I'm not sure. Um, Ash does not talk about faith a lot. Um, but when it comes to just 
um, non-binary stuff in specific. There are a lot of really good trans Christian YouTubers. Not a lot of them talk about the non-binary community a ton. So um, we are filming this panel and then Caro is going to do some additional interviews with some non-binary folks here, but in other parts of Canada who've connected with Generous Space. And so we will be looking to create Belonging in the Body 2.0, non-binary journeys of faith, simply because there aren't a lot of voices that integrate faith and this reality that um, for some of us is still a lot to get our heads around. I think the grace is that as you listen to these folks, it took them a little while to get their heads around it too. And yet I hope that you hear in their stories that as they have come into their own in this sense of their identity, I know that over the time I've known, especially Beck and Lids, that I've seen literally your countenances change with a deep inner peace and joy and deeper sense of self. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Please say, thank the panel.